we will be moving on to our first panel of the day and uh elizabeth take it take it away for the the panel discussion thank you so much it is great to be here today i am happy to chair this panel and to get to know you too since we've never really met before i'm excited to hear your stories and hear your advice about this topic i think that leadership and communication is something that always needs to be worked on even if you are personally think you're great at it i think there's always room for improvement so i think new stories are always welcome and new advice is always welcome and so just a little bit more about myself i'll introduce myself briefly and then i'm going to have each of you introduce yourselves and so i'm elizabeth berry as i said i'm a postdoctoral fellow at new york medical college and i study the realm of neuroscience and i work on the impact that opioids have on the orexin system in the brain and i use a lot of electrophysiology and a lot of histological techniques and my experience with being a leader or a team player involves being a PhD student since I just graduated this past May and involves me collaborating with students who are younger than me and also collaborating with my chair committee members as well as my PI. And so I have a perspective that's from the student level. And then you two, I think, have very different perspectives. I'm excited that all of us are able to bring these different perspectives to the table. And so if you could please both introduce yourselves briefly, and then we'll get started into our 15 minute session with some questions. You can go ahead, Stuart, first. Are you sure? Oh, okay, thank you so much. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so I'm Stuart Mortley. Uh, I'm a professor here at University of Antwerp. And I think I've been in science for about 30 years now. So I started off in the UK. I did my bachelor's and my PhD in pharmacology. So I too am an electrophysiologist. I used to be. Uh, I moved out of that into molecular biology and I work extensively on g protein coupled receptors, actually the targets of opioids and arexins that uh, you're working on. So Really? <laughs> yes, we definitely have. And I'm very much interested in, uh, actually at the moment I'm working on something related to Alzheimer's at the moment. So, uh, And from my experience, I've sort of, I'd like to think I've done the whole range. I've been an undergraduate, I've been a postgraduate, I've been a postdoc, I've been a PI. I've been a departmental chair, I've been an uh, A director of institute. So I've experienced both the top and at the bottom. Although, you know, using such phrases, top and bottom is sort of rather hierarchical. I think it's just a case of more or less experience. And as you get on, you realize that everyone can be right and everyone can have important input, but somebody who is fairly green and new to science or somebody who's been in science for like me for about 30 years. So that's just a little, bit of my experience and so uh, I deal with a lab every day or deal with a group or a department every day so it's sort of uh, a lot of what you realize a lot of what science is is uh, controlling the the activity of people to make sure everything works effectively and I'm very much interested in in a mission focus I think at the end of the day we're all sort of servants to science you know we hold this thing up as science as this sort of not really a pinnacle of truth, but we're trying to get there. You know, and one of our best favorites is progress, not perfection. We're never going to get to perfection, but we hope to make progress every day. It could be big, could be small, and that could be intellectual, could be personal, or could be academic. So as long as we always focus on daily progress, we'll find out that we'll eventually get there. <laughs> so over to you, Sarah. Hello. Thanks, um, <laughs> uh, can you hear me? Yep. All yes, good. Great. Great. Um, I'm Sarah Grunison. I, I started out actually back in my university days as a chemical engineering major. Um, at the time, I was minoring in both computer science and music, and I shifted my degree um, after the end of my third year of chemical engineering into uh, computer science and engineering. And I uh, was a software engineer for a good 20 years, and I had um, a hat in uh, many different uh, positions um, from agile coach to change manager to uh, having my own business um, uh, and doing all kinds of things related to computer science and engineering. Um, uh, now I am a director of engineering at a company called Novoda based in London. 
And I also have my own uh, coaching uh, business. So I am a leadership uh, trainer and coach. So um, that's just a little bit about me. Awesome. Thank you so much. So now for the exciting part, we can get into the actual questions to give people advice, give us give our experiences over. And so we have about 15 minutes for this block. And I want each of you to be able to contribute to the, each of the questions. So make sure that you give the other person enough room to answer. Um, so question number one. So as a team member, how can you effectively manage upwards and ensure collaboration runs smoothly when leadership is not effective? Who wants to take this first? Oh, it's you, Sarah. <laughs> okay. Um, so when, when I am trying to manage up, uh, let's say, it starts with, uh, it's actually quite similar to, let's say, trying to collaborate with someone um, at your level. Uh, it's about trying to uh, see the person, hear them, understand them. What is beneath what they're asking for? Um, usually the reason that a person would manage up is because they're feeling, for example, micromanaged. That, that's like a, a typical uh, scenario. And um, micromanagement feels very daunting. It feels very stressful. Um, someone is checking in on you. You don't feel trusted. You don't feel like uh, you have any autonomy. And um, it's very easy to go into this feeling of this person is a um, a hole or uh, something is uh, um, uh, um, horrible about this person. You can even go into thinking that they're a narcissist or something like this. Um, However, uh, statistically, uh, most are probably not narcissists. Um, uh, there's very few um, uh, people with NPD uh, in the world. So usually um, what is driving this person's behavior is um, uh, some need that is lacking, um, something that um, is in their core value system, uh, something that they need to thrive, and it's not there in that room with you at that moment. So uh, the best way I feel like uh, to create this connection is to try to get to that core need. So let's say um, uh, you, uh, for example, myself, one of my core needs is autonomy and trust, authenticity, um, uh, um, reliability is one of my core values. I may accidentally also step into a micromanaging type of situation if I don't feel like you're being reliable. Um, I, I, you said you're going to do something and then uh, it's not being delivered. Um, uh, there's a good way to have those conversations and there's a not so great way to have those conversations. And usually the best way to step into those conversations is to start with I. I am feeling this. I am feeling... Um, stressed i i don't feel i i i can uh, move forward with my with my plans i'm feeling just uh, um, uh, irritated um and this is because my core need is reliability and when i see uh this this that think scientifically think on facts happening um uh, uh, then these feelings are triggered in me. When you talk like that, you're not blaming the other person for your feelings, because as we all know, my feelings of uh, reliability could be rooted in my past. Maybe my, my parents were never there when I needed them to be there, and therefore it's something that I need drastically, which someone else you might work with might not need as much. So now let's go back to leading up. It's about helping that manager start speaking an I instead of you. So when they're saying, hey, you're so uh, um, unreliable or you're, you're, you're just not paying any attention or you just don't care, instead of getting into the defense, it's like um, uh, I'm, I'm hearing uh, what you say and that's your perspective and everyone can have their own perspective, but what are you feeling? What, what is your need here? Uh, what 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 are the facts? What 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 are, what are we trying to address? And what can we do to get to that place where you can feel more confident uh, moving forward? So that is, let's say, a very condensed uh, way of um, leading up. Uh, is just about getting the other person to their feelings and getting them to talk an I when maybe at the beginning they start with you and knowing yourself well enough not to go into defense right away. That that's is not so actually important. probably about you. Absolutely. I think that's really important to point out because from a student perspective, 
you might immediately go on the defensive and not know why you're on the defensive and not realize that your superior is talking in those you terms and that's what's making you feel that's anxious. The defense. Yeah, that's right, the, exactly. So I think nobody I think knows it, you. Like exactly, you know. right. So if you could like actually kind of pull yourself out of it, think about what words were actually being said and pinpoint that, I think that's a step in the right direction. I think that's great. Thanks so much. No problem. I think those are some really interesting points, and uh, it's a really nice dissection that you've done on the, some of the uh, the aspects of managing up. I've 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 experienced this both myself personally, and I've been on the receiving end of it personally, as everyone has. And I think uh, it's very nice that you said that uh, with respect to a bit of introspection first about why am I doing this, what do I need, and uh, but also from my perspective as well a lot of science uh, and a lot of motivation in people is I've always found it's the maintenance on the big picture. And the reason why we're doing this is a lot of people feel disenfranchised when they feel disconnected from the mission, from the project, from the program. And often, as you said, with micromanagement, uh, you might feel as an underling in a department or in a lab is that you're just not part of that big machine you're actually separated, you're taken out of the equation somehow, and you're in like a little alternative cycle. You're not actually part of that greater structure. So in a way, feelings of disengagement do engender this concept of, I need to engineer myself back into the program. So actually, the first thing to do if you are feeling in this situation is to, first of all, instantly, honestly discuss this with your line manager above and say, I'm not feeling it. I don't know exactly why I'm not feeling it, but let's talk about it. And that's what you want to hear as a manager is that sort of let's talk about it first rather than do actions. You know, what you don't want them to do is to instantly go around you and go up to your superior and say, oh, I'm having problems. Because then as soon as your line manager finds out, he's going to go or she is going to go do the communications broken down. So you've really it's much better to start it off with honesty because that's what they want to hear. You always want to hear. I mean, as a leader, scientist, whatever, you thrive and you dream that all you'll ever get is good news. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Sorry. Sorry, people. It's not going to happen. It's, it's largely bad news, but that's OK. That's the way it is. Don't see it as bad news. Just see it as news. Just see it as, you know, if science was easy, it would have all been done by now. It's a simple fact. It's just about, you know, sort of if I was to encapsulate my sort of like modus operandi as a scientist is just fixing problems. All you do is fix problems uh, that they, they can be academic, they can be technical, they can be intellectual, they can be personal. If you can just fix problems, you're going to be the greatest scientist and researcher ever. So you should never feel as though in this circumstance where there could be a lack of uh, engagement of a person, don't take it personally. It's part of a program. We're all part of this big machine called science. It's not, I don't own it, you don't own it. It's a thing. It's contribution to the great uh, increase of knowledge. So in a way, having that first honest discussion first, because then everyone will appreciate it. Because I'm sure if you talk to your manager, they might also have that exact same feeling to their superior, but they don't <laughs> want to tell you that because they have to maintain this sort of sphere of infallibility. So that's one thing it's important to realize that humbling, even though let's say you're like a first year grad student or something, you might feel as though you're at the bottom of the totem pole. Everyone above you is just the same. Those are a little bit older. They also have anxiety and fear over their position in the chain. So it's actually normal. It's perfectly normal. And if you're not paying attention and you're not engaging your personal feelings and your drive in with the program, I'd be worried. I would want you to feel a little upset at times because if you didn't, it means you don't care. And Absolutely. that's a worse problem. So exactly. yeah. we, should, we shouldn't be worried about these issues. It's, it's perfectly normal. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's great. Um, I, I think if an open communication environment can be built, 
then the chain, the people on the bottom of the totem pole and all throughout would feel comfortable coming to each other and actually bringing these topics up. And I think that's the point that a lot of things struggle with. There's not the open communication that's laid out that you would feel comfortable coming to. And I think that leads us actually perfectly into the next question because we wanna talk about what your advice is for navigating conflicts and when it arises and having difficult conversations. So how do you get that communication open so you can talk about the difficult things that come up? So maybe you can give us an example each that um, really stuck out to you through your years. Okay, uh, well actually, so here's, the, here's my sort of take on dealing with anything like this. And dealing with all problems in science and research full stop is there's, it's horses for courses. Every single situation has a unique contextuality. So I've actually, I've never attacked the same issue. Let's say there's a conflict or whatever. I've never approached it in the same way each time. In the same way, I've never done research in the same way, in the same time, in a paper. Every, every paper we do and every bit of research we do is an incremental change. So I've done everything. I've done everything from individual private meetings. And so actually, it's a bit like a legal case in a way. As a manager, it, when you're dealing with some issues, is the first thing you want to do is you want to do fact finding. You want to find as many, because often these things start with a single conversation. And that conversation is always from one person's point of view. So you have to sort of do what they call in the, the legal field discovery. So you have to do the discovery phase of really understanding what happens. And at that phase, sure, you can say, OK, I understand your grievance. Let's, I'll take this on board. I'll respond to you after I've done the discovery process. So that's done in a perfectly open way. Collect as much information as you can. Then the best thing to do, if they're agreeing, is to do this in a consensual manner. Is not There's nothing worse than closed door meetings or clandestine meetings. That's the worst thing possible because no one trusts the responses from them. As a manager, you're seen to be cloistering and as another person in the lab uh, if they're not in the meeting they don't know what's going on so i i've always tried to do things out in the open and also i try your best not to inflame the situation that's the hardest thing when you make a big deal out of conflict conflicts are going to happen every single day and it's likely that virtually everyone in your lab will have a conflict with somebody else at some point Clearly, there are some circumstances where this is serious, where there are legal ramifications. Then that's completely different. Normal day-to-day -day conflicts in the lab actually are much more common, thankfully, than the more serious accusations that can occur. That's a different situation. In this scenario, I'm talking about more day-to-day -day conflicts. So essentially, having an open practice, and, and we've actually had sessions in, you know, very much like, I don't know if you've seen intervention, you know, for people who are, you know, addicted is used to be on a and e you know that they'd always have the person that have their family and friends around and they're trying to help them we do that we do interventions to try and solve the problem not so much from a point of view of aiming and the important thing here is not to aim it at one person because it's very unlikely that conflicts are based on one person it's normally a, a shared feel and even if it is to just that one person other people are also involved so never split the team up could be a big team, could be a small team, could be a group, could be a department. Never split the team up. Everything is done as a team. And the important thing is to try and, you know, not to sort of kiss and make up on the first day, but tell everyone that this could take a while to sort out if there are long term issues. And the best thing to do is, is to let people sleep on it. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> My goodness, it's amazing a good night's rest and a bit of thought can solve a situation because everyone gets makes bad decisions very quickly. Give you and a new perspective can, after you sleep. <laughs> absolutely, it's, it's sobering, it really is. So in this circumstance, I've just been talking about, you know, relatively simple conflicts. When there are serious conflicts, part of that discovery phase, the most important thing is documentation. So that is critical. Hard and fast documentation is the most important thing. Let's say there's you know, some form of abuse or there's some form of harassment. The most important thing is documentation. Even if it's from the complainant first, take written statements as soon as possible. 
write everything down and um, keep it secure. Everything can only be done with written backup. It's much better to do that. So that's a sort of uh, a practical approach uh, to conflicts. That, and the most important thing is to understand that they're always going to happen. And yeah. pe the person who is uh, suffering from it shouldn't feel victimized. The person who's trying to manage it shouldn't feel bad that this happened. So this mm. often is, is often an issue as well. Managers can feel as though they failed if there are people having conflicts in the lab. It's normal. It's normal. But as I found, both academically, personally, and intellectually, doing it as a group is the most important thing. I think that's so a great point. Yeah, I really do. I um, I think a lot of mentors typically go to the closed door instead of having the open lab. And I think I think that's a mistake now that you pointed out. And I really think that that should be taken to heart and everyone really should do the open door policy because then everyone's included. You don't feel isolated, mm -hmm. especially as someone on the bottom of the totem pole. And then you might feel like you can actually talk to the people in your lab about the issue exactly. instead of just festering with it by yourself. Thanks so much. What about you, Sarah? Um, <clears throat> what I think is very important is to realize that you can have two people in the same room experiencing the same event, yet seeing two different stories and feeling two different things based on past life experience, based on personality, um, based on um, emotional connections. Um, so you can have completely different stories and both are factually correct. And that's something that's vital to know when you're a leader and somebody is coming to you with their story. Um, I uh, think that uh, Stuart was uh, already talking a little bit about this. Um, I really try to never, although never is a big word, I'm human, I will also make this mistake sometimes, um, to jump into one of the three roles uh, within the drama triangle. So you have the victim, you have the persecutor, and you have uh, the, the hero. Very often uh, you have the victim coming in and saying this horrible thing happened, and then you as a leader, oh, I am the hero, I'm gonna come and save this. You have an opinion, but this thing, person that this person said sounds very horrible, and then you go and you try to fix it. That's not empowerment. Empowerment is instead getting this person to, similarly to what I mentioned in the last um, uh, question, to factually think about what exactly happened, what are the facts without the feelings. So um, somebody uh, uh, doesn't show up to meetings or they, they show up every day 15 minutes late or they don't deliver the work uh, on time, they deliver the work the next day. These are factual statements and owning your own feelings with regards to those statements and helping that person uh, create their own uh, um, their own courageous conversation around that. So uh, this thing is happening, this is the feeling I have, and this is what I need in order to proceed and empowering that person to step into that conversation themselves. I, I avoid if uh, at all possible to be the one that starts the conversation. I try to encourage this person to to have that conversation themselves. I will do role playing with them if they need it. I will um, uh, even mediate if I need to. Um, if you study mediation, uh, mediation is really not picking a side. Instead, it's really about evaluating the facts and helping them uh, get uh, toward something, uh, towards a resolution which in a way both people can thrive, both people can move forward, and there's not a right person and a wrong person. Again, as Stuart mentioned, there are the situations in which there's real sexual harassment or somebody is doing something which is um, uh, not inclusive in a very mean way or, or doing something which uh, is just against the rules. In this case, as he said, it is about documentation. Um, and it's important when you are documenting to try to stick to facts. Um, instead of writing, oh, this person is a da da da, or they think this, you never know what another person is thinking. You never know what another person is feeling. Keep that out of it. Instead, keep factual. Um, uh, this person 
touched me on the butt or this person asked me this inappropriate question, don't say inappropriate, this person asked me this question because the inappropriate is an opinion. So try to keep uh, your, let's say, adjectives and personal opinions out of it, keep to the facts, because then when later you want to go back and review it, we can look at it from different lenses, from different perspectives and try to get a place forward uh, together. So keep away from drama, don't try to be a hero, don't jump in as a persecutor. Try to empower the victim into a place of ownership and um, empowering them to have this conversation themselves. If they feel unable to do this, offer to be a mediator in the situation. Don't pick sides. Try to stick to the facts and try to get back to the roots of what both people need in that situation. What are they missing? What, what is the what is the, the hurt? Where, where is that coming from? And in the end, if it's something which is really against the rules or um, uh, hurtful, uh, in a way that is is uh, needs to have some kind of repercussions. Uh, document it, date it, and take out all of your superfluous uh, adjectives and opinions about how people feel and uh, um, what kind of statement that is. And uh, that is um, a summary. That's great. That's really I um, keeping the facts. I think that really ties into thinking. All right, do not blow up about something that happened. Don't escalate things in your mind. You're going to add adjectives into your mind. And then when you speak to your supervisor, they are going to come out of your mouth. So if you can keep the facts straight, maybe write them down yourself before you go into a meeting. I think that's fantastic. And it's OK uh, to own your feelings and say, yeah. when this person does that, it's making me feel this. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the documentation part, right. that's the facts. Right. And then yeah. you don't want to get confused and blow things out of proportion when you are doing that. And I think it's also important that two people, same situation, both of their facts can be correct. Yeah, that's you, can have, the... you can have two different convictions existing in the same room. Right. And the way that's possible is honoring everyone's values in yes. the same room. Absolutely. Thank you for that. That's fantastic. No problem. Um, and then so our last question, we'll do this briefly. And so we can have one audience question pop in. Um, I want to know what your top three most important traits of an effective leader and an effective team member would be. OK, Sarah, over to you. Yeah, um, so I think I have mentioned some of this in the last couple of questions. I think the three biggest, uh, let's say, features you should have as a leader is the ability to differentiate. Uh, from what's really happening to uh, what, where you are in another person's perspective, that it's not the same and it doesn't have to be the same. Be able to self-actualize. Who am I? What do I need? W what do I need to thrive? What are my core values? What is my history? What schemas are at play here? Be able to self-actualize and to integrate. So be able to take that self-actualization and be able to integrate it within the group so that everyone can exist within the same space and uh, everyone can be empowered to bring their, let's say, superpowers on board. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much. No problem. Those are fantastic. Those are really good. I, uh, I sort of, uh, I, I've been in a leadership position now for a long time, so I, I often think initially of that, and then I have to then wind the clock back to remember when I was a student. So <laughs> from, from my recent history, I'd say my experience as a leader, and, and a lot of, so the majority of people who go into science do at some point want to be a leader, whether it's uh, of a group, of a university department, whatever. The most important thing I've found is responsibility, and that's what leaders really are you don't have to be the best you don't have to be the hardest working you don't have to be the smartest but it's about taking responsibility for the program or the the, the work stream or the pipeline and that's what separates a leader from other things it's it's the ability to take responsibility for the integrity of the program and that brings me to my second point is integrity is having a consistency of fairness honesty and uh, treatment of all people. And that can only be shown, that can only be done through action. You can say, yes, I have integrity, put it on your bio, blah, blah, blah. But it's not for you, it's not your label, it's what other people think of you. You can only achieve that label in other people's eyes by showing that fairness. So 
you are, you know, you have integrity by being fair and honest with as many people as possible. And the final point of being a leader is also to keep everyone on mission. I, as a student, I mean, this actually links back to being a student. Uh, I don't want to break anyone's heart out there, but if you're going to do a PhD and stuff, there will be many days where you think I'm going nowhere and what am I doing and what's going on and even into postdoc and even into PI and stuff. But the thing I work on the most when I'm dealing with people who are, let's say, disenfranchised or bored or it's a dull day is to infuse them and say, look, what we're doing now might seem tiny, a grain of sand in the Sahara. But this grain of sand will eventually end up in this prize at the end of the line. Could be 20 years from now, but you'll be part of something in which we cured a disease. So understand that it is critical. Even a, a dull Thursday, a single Western blot could be a critical component in that discovery. Don't underestimate any, even the smallest action. So as far as being a team member uh, or being a student within a team, I think honesty just like being a leader is the most important thing. And often as a young scientist in a group, the worst thing that can happen is that someone does something and they're not honest about it. Someone makes a mistake and they're terrified to tell their boss because their boss would go, oh my goodness. <laughs> I've done that a few times. And I've had to say, dude, I'm gonna have to give me five minutes while I just sit and fume for a few seconds. And then we get back on track. So I don't blow my stack or anything like that. But it's important that I know. So being honest about why you love science, why you want to do it, and being honest about what you do with your supervisor, it will, it will help you. It's not just a virtue, but it will actually help you develop as a person. Be honest about how you feel, be honest about what you do. And I think the other most important feature is perseverance. Mm -hmm. this, is what, this is what I work on on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, my I always use this phrase. I, I live on catchphrases and stuff. And my old boss would tell me, you know, what's the difference between the good labs in the world and the great labs in the world? And he says, the good labs have 2% success rate and the great labs have 3% success rate. And that's it. It's sad and true, but it's uh, unless you're willing to deal with the downs. Right. You know, downs is just like, bread and butter, that you're going to deal with downs all the time. So enjoy your victories, but dealing with the downs. And so perseverance is the most important thing. You have to be ready to pick your own head up and continue on. Yeah, you have to realize that. And that's part of being honest, you know, mm -hmm. why am with I With yourself, doing right. Exactly, yeah. exactly. That's great. Those are some really important traits. Um, and I think we have what time for like one question. Um, there's one question up here that says, so when you're extremely busy, um, but you want to maintain leadership, what is something that you can do to actually take the time, even if it's a short amount of time, to show that you're being a leader and communicate that down to your team members? Like some meeting, for example, or you whatever. Do you want to take that, Sarah? Or? Yes, um, I... I guess I, I, I'm, I'm usually having quite a lot on my plate. So um, I, as, as I said, I was a director of engineering. I have um, uh, my own business on the side. I have three children. I have a couple of dogs. Um, I, and I'm asked very often, how do you do it all um, without like losing your shit? Um, I, sorry, I swear sometimes. <laughs> um, for, for myself, I, it's about I, I, I usually pause. It, it's, it's maybe something that and other pe people like move like directly into and like do this and that. I'm, I'm very thoughtful about what my next step is going to be. So I pause and I reflect and I prioritize. And sometimes I remove things off of my plate which don't have the right priority. They're not contributing to the situation anymore. Maybe they're not as important anymore um, because I only have so much time and so much space. Part of my prioritization always is people. So I, for some reason, can always make time for that one on one with a report, no matter what is going on. I will uh, stop and move something to the side. Maybe I, I won't write um, that report as in much detail as I thought I, I would before. It will be um, maybe 75%, but that's okay. Um, 
it's always important to handle the situation right away because we were talking about conflict before. Conflict gets worse when time uh, happens in, in the middle. You need to address it right away. You need to address people's emotions right away. You need to address situations right away. And um, just like my children, I will always stop and make time for them when they need it. So I think that's my my um, trick for being able to manage it all is being good at stopping and reflecting on what's important. And um, again, what Stuart said about integrity, I know what my values are. I mean, I even have them all the time sitting in front <laughs> of me. <laughs> One of my uh, uh, um, ones here is reliability, as I mentioned before, and, and the fifth one is empathy. Um, I cannot be a leader if I'm not stepping forward with integrity with regards to my values. And this is part of self-actualization. So uh, it's it's just very important to make that time. That's great. Yeah, I think um, being able to communicate that you will stop for your team members and listen to them is all they need to be like, they trust me, they are going to listen to me, and I can actually tell them what I need to and be heard. And it's I important to be present. That's yes. something which, especially when you're in the office or in the lab or something, you know, when you're like walking past someone and you're hurrying off to a meeting and somebody says something like to you on the way. Um, earlier, Sarah, when I was younger, would just be like, I'm in a hurry. I'm just running past it. Now I will stop and I will be mentally present because that meeting can wait five minutes. That presence and being fully there for someone goes so far. So be present. Perfect. Well, thank exactly. you so much. Yeah, um, I think we're going to have to wrap up. OK, uh, this sorry. <laughs> sorry, I took your time. Sorry. No, no, no. The next session you, starting. You hit the nail on the head. Um, but this was such a fun session, such a fun panel. The discussions we had were fantastic. And I, I hope it helped a lot of people that were listening or can listen back some other time. And I just want to thank you guys for coming here. It was nice to meet you virtually. And um, the next session will be occurring at 13, uh, 1430 GMT, so in about nine minutes from now. So quick little break for those of you on here, and then you can hop back on in about nine minutes. Thanks thank so much. Thank you so much for inviting me. Okay, thank you so much. Me. You, a great panel chair. Thank yes, you. Thank you. Are. Great to meet you. <laughs> Bye. Cheerio. Bye. Thank you so much, everyone. That was fantastic. Bye.